multidisciplinary conversations on Jack inhibitors, a live social media event. I'd like to welcome everybody here, and we're very excited to have uh, a very interactive conversation about Jack inhibitors, a really important new therapeutic. Uh, addition to our armamentarium. I'm Peter Leo. I'm going to be the moderator for this event. I'm a clinical assistant professor of dermatology and pediatrics at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. I'm also the founding director of the Chicago Integrative Eczema Center. I have to unmute. Hi, I'm Jamie Kanukin. I'm an IBD specialist at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Thanks for having me here, Dr. Leo. Thank you. And I'm Grace Wright, rheumatologist in New York City, consultant rheumatologist there, and also founder and president of the Association of Women in Rheumatology, and thrilled to be here as well. Thank you also for coming. This is so neat because we have different specialties talking about the same category of medication, and this almost never happens in the real world. We rarely get to talk outside of talking about an individual patient. So our introduction is that in this program, we're going to be discussing some of the current safety data for JAK inhibitors across immune-mediated conditions in dermatology, gastroenterology, and rheumatology. We're going to think about the implications of the outcomes from the oral surveillance study across different patient populations. We'll share some real-world experiences that are related to the safety profile of JAK inhibitors against other systemic or biologic immunotherapies. And then we'll talk about including patients and shared decision-making and how we do this when we actually are going to try to prescribe a JAK inhibitor. And finally, going over some of the benefits of education for the medical community, because these are still pretty new and there's a lot to talk about. So just to give us a little bit of an overview of the kind of the landscape when we're talking about JAK inhibitors, these have been around now for about a decade, but increasingly are becoming important and are getting a whole bunch of new, we're getting a bunch of new molecules, we're getting a bunch of new indications, and it's happening at a rapid pace. So uh, not, not in any particular order here, but we're seeing some of the different medications uh, roughly maybe in the, in the order that they were approved, tofacitinib, which targets JAK1, JAK3, and JAK2, baricitinib, JAK1, JAK2, and JAK3. And we can see some of the different indications, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. We can see with baricitinib, we have alopecia areata. Then we have upadacitinib and abracitinib. Those uh, have some differing indications as well. Upadacitinib has a whole bunch, as you can see, including ulcerative colitis, uh, where abracitinib is only indicated right now in the United States for atopic dermatitis. Uh, and then the list goes on, including things like ruxolitinib, which currently we have both an oral and a topical version of, and ducravacitinib and ritalocitinib and so on. So we're going to kind of get into these, but this gives you a sense of how many molecules there are and how many different indications. So our experiences, of course, across different patient populations, across different molecules, and even different dosing. I often think uh, I see my patients with atopic dermatitis and Maybe we're using upadacitinib in a patient and I'm putting them on the 15 milligram dose. And they took it the other day. A patient said, you know, my brother is on it for ulcerative colitis at 45 milligrams a day, mm -hmm. three times what we're starting. So this is kind of interesting to think about. Not only is the population different, but the dosing can be different as well. And, and when we think about what we use in rheumatology, we really have had this now, as you said, for nine, 10 years, starting off with tofacitinib. And the approvals were really based on uh, very rigorous randomized uh, controlled trials that were double blind. So sort of laid out here. And what is important really is to understand that we study these drugs in different populations. So for some patients, they've only seen the first thing, they've seen methotrexate. Others have gone on to see a host of the other, what we call CSD marts, drugs like leflunamide, um, azathioprine, hydroxychloroquine, and then many others have already advanced to advanced therapies are biologic DMARDs um, and still had an incomplete uh, response or problems tolerating uh, those agents. So whether it's tofacitinib, baricitinib, upadacitinib, we've got assessments across all of those looking at responses in joints. For rheumatologists, that's where we start. But we also want to know that we're helping our patients function better. If I can't get you back into your life, sort of functioning, working, and living, then I have done you not the full service. So improvement in physical function is also studied. And since we want to make sure that we uh, protect your joints, we also investigate the slowing of radiographic progression or the inhibition of radiographic progression so that we don't have uh, joints being destroyed and patients being forced to go on to orthopedic surgery uh, just to restore function. So 
very rigorously studied, but we have this now across multiple types of persons and multiple uh, uh, therapies. So that gives us some confidence in the efficacy. I agree. And a lot of times with some of the newer indications, patients will feel like they're a guinea pig and they're asking, you know, how, how much experience have you guys had with this? And we can say in good faith, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of patients who've been on these medications for different indications uh, across the world. So we really are building more and more. Um, one of the things I'd love to get into a little bit is how the rheumatoid arthritis indication has set the tone for the safety as well, because I think that's that's really an important piece uh, when we think about that. But maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the, the basic, the evidence too, first, and, and how it's worked across different conditions. But and I'll focus a little bit on atopic dermatitis as well. We know that when we look at the cross, you know, th this is difficult to compare efficacy across studies. In fact, you really shouldn't because even though it's tempting, if you have the same outcome, for example, in this case, we're looking at the eczema area and severity index of 75% or greater, right? So easy 75 is a good metric to show you got pretty substantial improvement of your eczema. The problem is people will just take a number from one study and a number from another, and you can't head to head them because it's different populations. It may be different duration. It may all be different ways that they handled people that drop out or have an adverse event. So you can't do it, but what you can do and I think is a, it's been shown to be pretty reliable is what they call the Bayesian network meta-analysis, where you can sort of control these things using some very fancy mathematics and using the placebo groups to kind of help anchor it. And they can give it a relative sort of index. And this particular chart we're showing here was put together by ICER, the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. I really like them because I feel like they're kind of cold and calculating. They're, they're really mostly for the payers. So they're sort of not trying to cater to any company. They're not really even catering to clinicians or patients, but they're looking at sort of showing what is the, the brass tax of the efficacy. And we can see here they've, they've listed a lot of the newer atopic dermatitis systemic therapies uh, in order, and we're getting a sense of, of the efficacy. And we can really see that upadacitinib and abracitinib, the two that are approved for atopic dermatitis, really do have a leg up on many of the other therapies, even dupilumab, which is one of our, our most powerful biologics, especially when we look at the higher doses of the, the JAK inhibitors, that they're higher dose. It's really, I think, pretty substantial and, and meaningful difference. Uh, when we look at our topical a JAK inhibitor for atopic dermatitis, and that's not pictured here, but there was a nice study that had a comparative arm of a mid-potency topical steroid, triamcinolone, and it did numerically actually better. It wasn't powered to show superiority, but it was certainly non-inferior. So again, we now have a, a topical non-steroidal that is on par with a mid-potency corticosteroid, which is kind of a big deal. I'd be curious, in gastroenterology and in rheumatology, do you feel that the JAK inhibitors have kind of a similar, similar role of being pretty powerful new entrants into this, this armamentarium? Yeah, yeah for sure. And go ahead. I Let's talk about it in GI first. Yeah, they. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that we've, you know, we've been able to see really incredible efficacy, especially in patients that have been um, very medication exposed or refractory to other therapies. You know, I think that the challenge that we have is that there are often patients where we want to use this first line, and and there's data that supports that it has great efficacy in a bio naive patient or a patient that has not been on therapy. But because of the FDA label, we're having to position it behind a TNF therapy, and so we'll. I think we'll get into a little bit about why that label change happened after the approval um, uh, in, in the next kind of couple slides when we talk about safety. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's some patients where, you know, this is a rescue therapy in the hospital for patients with acute severe ulcerative colitis, and it's been studied both in tofacitinib as well as upadacitinib. And um, we've been able to see, you know, pretty incredible efficacy and reduction in three-month colectomy rates with use of these therapies in that acute setting. But again, you have to set up the right patient. Yeah, and you know, in, in rheumatology, the later you are in sort of the life cycle, you're looking at patients who may have failed, not one, not two, but six or seven um, uh, different advanced therapies. So we know that we have data that says this can work even when many others have failed. And so for me, that is always helpful because yes, you get the best outcomes when you start off early, but what about those patients who just did not have that option early on in their uh, journey with, with these diseases. And so it's really wonderful to see that kind of efficacy. So that really brings us to the other side. So it sounds like in all three of our specialties, there is no question that these are among the most efficacious treatments. They're very powerful. 
But with that great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. And we know that we have some monitoring and some safety issues to talk about. So I would be curious, I'll, I'll describe what we're doing in dermatology. And I'd love to hear how you guys are, are managing it as well. So baseline and annually, of course, we're doing our tuberculosis test, our hepatitis screening. I'm sometimes checking for HIV status as well, because those patients were generally excluded from the studies. And then CBC, metabolic panel and lipids. And then at month one, I'm usually again, looking particularly at lipids, but I'm often just doing the complete blood count and metabolic panel as well. And then every three months and sometimes spacing that out even more afterwards, if things are going well. And of course, if things aren't going well, then we might shorten that interval. Are you guys doing the same thing? Like if, for example, if we're an ulcerative colitis patient, is this the sort of same basic approach? Yeah, you know, and interesting, I'll, I'll chat with my pharmacist about the HIV because they, they were excluded in the clinical trials, but that is not something that we routinely check as part of our pre-monitoring labs. But similarly, we're looking at blood counts, we're looking at, you know, kidney function as well as liver and then lipids. When we don't do the lipids, um, we do lipids annually after we check them first at that one month mark um, to ensure that that LDL rise, which, which is known and was seen in the clinical trial program, but doesn't appear that it was associated with any cardiovascular increased risk um, related to sort of direct relationship to the LDL. Um, but we are doing this. And I think it's important to just have that plan and enrolling them, depending on your institution, in, in a monitoring program so that these patients don't slip through the cracks. Um, and being more proactive about it as opposed to reactive, patient realizes they don't get labs for three months and now they're waiting for their prescription and now they're off therapy. And, you know, the, the positives about the, the JAK inhibitors is that they have a fairly short half-life when we compare them to some of our biologics, right? But in somebody who is reliant on that level of a, you know, immune modulation to be able to achieve healing in, in any of our disease states, uh, we certainly don't want them to be without their medications. So. Yeah, and we, we're pretty similar in rheumatology. Um, the, the difference for us is that we may not uh, routinely check lipids before starting because it doesn't exclude you from being on therapy. But what we do know is that our patients with immune-mediated disease are at higher risk for cardiovascular consequences. So lipids and thinking about cardiovascular risk, which we'll see again when we talk about oral surveillance, becomes critically important when we think about safety and potential benefits and outcomes for patients beyond the scope of what happens in their joints. Because as I always say, you know, your joints hurt, but it's your heart that ultimately conveys mortality risk. So again, very important to understand that. I, I think that's really interesting. And I, I've gently tried to impart that concept to my patients because I do see a fair number of patients where we see some lipid elevation and I often sort of shrug my shoulders. You know, it's not catastrophic. It's not a dangerous level where I'm worried about acute pancreatitis, but I say, well, we don't really know if this is, has the same meaning as a marker of cardiovascular risk as somebody who we're just checking normally, you know, which we definitely understand. Uh, but here, maybe it is sort of a false, you know, it sort of has a false meaning. We just can follow it and don't have to necessarily treat it. Do you feel like if the lipid levels were to get high enough, would you work with primary care or would you prescribe something to try to lower those, those lipids? Yeah, because, you know, we, what we learned um, going back many years now is that even with normal lipids, cardiovascular risk was increased. So we do a cardiovascular risk assessment independent of the lipid level. That's only one. Hypertension is the most common cardiovascular risk. And many patients walk in with that and don't even think oh, my heart is at risk. And then you add in uh, uh, a little bit of obesity, you add in some lipids, you're adding a slightly elevated A1C and voila, now suddenly you're looking at the perfect storm for cardiovascular compromise. So it's part of starting that conversation about your heart health and the impact that inflammation has on your cardiovascular system that extends beyond, you know, just sort of that, oh, let me get my EKG check because it's so much more than that. Inflammatory disease, systemic inflammatory disease has consequences beyond the joints. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out. I was going to say, you know, even if we think of safety of therapies, we have to also consider what's the safety of having severe inflammation, right? right. What is that risk? So our patients are at an increased risk for blood clots just with active inflammation. Our patients are at an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and outcomes related to their active inflammation. So, you know, I, I always tell patients that we have to weigh the safety um, and the, the, the benefits and the safety of therapies against the, the risk of having uncontrolled or undertreated inflammation. Absolutely. Great points. And I'll, I'll point out this figure before we move to our next slide. I love the figure which you see here on, on the right of the screen. This is actually from a paper by Chris Bunick at Yale. And I think it's important because it frames for me the discussion on how we're going to talk about the risks of these medications to individual patients and to a given patient, because we know that there is this sort of 
general sense that these risks are elevated, but what does that mean for an individual? And what I love about this in it has to be taken with a grain of salt because we're using kind of reference data and, and data that maybe cannot easily be compared directly. But in the center, it has just the general US reference for malignancy rate, venous thromboembolism, major adverse cardiovascular event, and non-melanoma skin cancer. The next rung is what does that look like in our atopic dermatitis patients from what we know, so our specific demographic. And then the final rung is what was seen in the studies, again, here for the two approved agents for atopic derm, upadacitinib and abracitinib. And it's really important important, I think, because it can show patients that these numbers are pretty comparable. We're not seeing a, a major elevation of these risks. Do you guys use anything like this? Do you have yeah. it for your disease states? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have the, the most data for rheumatoid arthritis, but it's essentially the same thing. It's this idea that your disease confers risk you're gonna walk in with a risk of VTE malignancy. And we see that in our US and global registry data. So it's cutting across uh, your genetics, your socioeconomics, right? Really to say that there is this background risk. And then when you put in the safety um, incidents that we see with the various therapies, you see it's kind of nestled. There are a couple of outliers. We'll talk about herpes zoster, for instance, is an outlier in terms of the incidence rate there. But MACE and VT and all of these things sort of go smack. So it's this idea that doing nothing doesn't keep you safe, right? Uncontrolled disease is not a good thing to have. Yeah, I really like this figure that that you have. And I think we don't, I have not seen one for ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, you know, kind of laid out similarly to this, but I would be putting one together. So I'll have to get yeah. your template for that. And I just, I love that concept that, right, there is a risk from the disease. And I think that's the big piece. You know, when we we're examining risk, we're like, well, these are kind of risky medicines, but I always try to tell my patients, right, we're not trying to give them out in the water, right? These are for people right. that are already suffering, that already have risk, that already have morbidity. Uh, and this is so important. So um, yeah, I'd love to talk about this slide next. Yeah, and you know, we're and you know, kind of shifting away from you know atopic dermatitis and rheumatoid arthritis, and really kind of going to we're focusing more on ulcerative colitis. We've been very fortunate, as you both have been, for an expanding toolbox. Right, the therapies that we have access to have significantly increased, and for us, within ulcerative colitis, within even the last six months, we've had addition of two additional mechanisms or additional therapies to our, our arsenal. So we're fortunate in that way, but it also means that those discussions that we have with patients become more challenging, right? Because now we have so many options and we don't have sort of predictive biomarkers to help us decide what are, uh, you know, what is the best therapy to start up front. So we do have some, you know, uh, population-based studies and we do have some things that help guide us in, in looking at predicting response. Um, but this, I think the slide just really speaks to a lot of the therapies and the classes that we have available to us and really comparing that efficacy and that safety and seeing that, you know, sometimes when you have a highly efficacious therapy, fast onset can use used as a rescue therapy, we're going to have to um, compromise in a way from a safety standpoint, whereas we have some of our gut selective therapies, our more inflammation selective therapies, both of which you don't use in your practices because they're so gut selective, that elizumab, that, you know, may be slower to onset to start. Um, but we, you know, have such a selectivity from a safety standpoint, it really has good safety. So this just slide kind of outlines that and is a really nice thing to show patients. And when we're kind of thinking through and, and discussing therapies, uh, what might be right for them. And we'll go to the next slide, you know, not really diving deep into the data. And you already had um, discussed some of the limitations when we look at network meta-analyses, um, you know, in the absence of robust head-to-head -head clinical studies, which we're fortunate in inflammatory bowel disease to have several within uh, Crohn's disease and, um, and ulcerative colitis, but not every therapy has a comparative analysis. And so when we look at these network meta-analyses, again, we have to take the data um, and understand that there are limitations here. Um, this actually was one that represents um, most of the therapies that are available except the most recently approved therapy for ulcerative colitis, atrazomod, is not in this um, current network meta-analysis. But you can see in all comers, so all patients with inflammatory bowel disease, whether they were TNF exposed or they were TNF exposed um, or TNF non-exposed, you know, bio-naive maybe, but they could have been exposed to another biologic, you can see that the JAK inhibitor upadacitinib really comes out on top and, and really from um, an efficacy standpoint comes out on top on, on each of these, you know, comparisons. So um, I think, again, highlighting that we have to to remember we can't use this therapy or we shouldn't be using this therapy in patients who don't have previous exposure to TNF unless they had a contraindication for TNF therapy um, and that this really needs to be considered second line behind TNF in, in our patients.
It's such a great point. And there's a question in the chat, and it's that if the JAK inhibitors are effective in patients who have no response to methotrexate, in, in the question here, they're asking in rheumatoid arthritis patients, why do we not start JAK inhibitors as a first line drug? It, I think the same question here, as, as you're alluding to, what, why do we have to go through a hoop to get them if they are more effective? Yeah, we've been uh, screaming about that for a long time, right? Because everything is tested against methotrexate in, in our world. And if you look at the previous slide, methotrexate and thiopurines, um, they're in the higher side of risk and the lower side of efficacy, but they're also the cheapest. Um, and so everything now gets tested against that anchor, but that doesn't mean that they're safe and effective across the board. So we have data in methotrexate naive patients for almost all of our products. But if they have high, you know, uh, moderate to severe disease activity, uh, but per the FDA, you know, you have to have gone through these others. So we still have this um, upside down approach, I think, where we don't start with the most effective therapy. Um, I think we should really be shifting towards the oncology model of get this under control, stop it, and then we can have a discussion and, and pull back. Um, so this is really about regulatory guidance, not about the scientific data that says this is the best and the most effective at this point. And part of that is because of the safety concerns, right? But again, methotrexate is to the right and the bottom here, at least in the in the world of ulcerative colitis. It's such a great point. I'll make two points on that. And it's just that I love that you brought cost in because that is certainly part of it. The other piece yeah. is inertia. You know, we've had these for a long time, so yes. it's difficult to let go. But I will say, I think it's changing. I'm part of the joint task force for the guidelines for atopic dermatitis, the allergy groups. I was kind of the token dermatologist on the allergy groups. And they actually have now made a recommendation against methotrexate for atopic dermatitis after all of these years. So I think we're beginning to see the change, which is pretty exciting. Well, I'd love to kind of dig into the oral surveillance study because, well, if I'm being a little cynical, this is what's poisoned the well for all of us here. This is what resulted in the box warning. I'd love for you to talk us yes, through it a little bit, Dr. Martin. It has done the same for us. So oral surveillance is a post-approval safety surveillance, right? So this was an event-driven trial to pick up on whether or not there were particular um, uh, signals and really looking at cardiovascular malignancy. So this is the only trial of its kind, and I suspect that it will live as the only trial of its kind. So that the primary objective here was to say, looking at tofacitinib, and this you know, started many, many, many years ago, the two doses, five milligrams twice daily or 10 milligrams twice daily, which by the way, in rheumatology is no longer used, and compare that with a TNF inhibitor. And in this case, it was adalimumab and utanosept. But the bottom line was that the population was defined as a cardiovascular risk enriched population. So you had to come in with at least one cardiovascular risk, you had to be at least 50 years of age, um, and you had to have already gone through methotrexate, right? So non-inferiority design. What we did see in the trial was that we had a bunch of people who were either current or former smokers just under half. BMIs were around 30, but you'll see there, I mean, these were people with, with real burden of disease. Lots of extra articular disease, 11% um, had car already had a, a cardiovascular disease, dyslipidemias, and hypertension was present in two thirds of patients. So again, the most common cardiovascular risk that we just sort of brush over is hypertension. And so the goal here was to say, what are the safety consequences? Now, how did this poison the water? And we can really talk about trial design, but the non-inferiority data um, failed. So we were not able to show that tofacitinib was non-inferior based on the safety. And if you just do one more click for me, we'll see sort of what the final conclusions were, was that there was an increased um, risk for all-cause mortality, an increased risk for malignancy and primarily lymphoma. Lung cancer popped up again. That is actually one of the solid tumors, the major solid tumor that has a signal in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, VTE, which is venous thrombomolism, pulmonary embolism, and arterial thrombosis arose as an increased risk. And maize for major adverse cardiovascular events was also increased. When we look at the post hoc analyses of this, the interesting thing here, just go back one, is to show that the risk was not continuous for all age groups. It was the 65 year olds who walked in with pre existing um, cardiovascular risk, high cardiovascular, those were the ones where risk was, was lumped. So my 40-year-old, my 30-year-old, my 55-year-old who has no cardiovascular risk, um, they did not have risks. 
the ones who were smokers were the ones who had risk. So older smokers, cardiovascular disease is where we see cardiovascular events and it's where we saw the cardiovascular events here. So yes, um, we think poisoning, but we don't want to say poisoning on the waters. But this is why the labels were changed, not just on the infertophacitinib, not just for rheumatoid arthritis, but across every inflammatory disease, across every drug, topicals as well as orals. So this is really a regulatory agency on the side of safety, right? So again, um, I, I take full responsibility for rheumatology conveying this burden uh, on GI and derm, but this is the state. And so I think that the good thing that comes out of oral surveillance is we have to be very mindful about risk stratification um, and having that discussion and actually doing that work with our patients because it pops up when you least expect it. And where you presume it is, it may be absent. It's not just age, right? It's all of these other factors. It's great points. I really think this this is where we're at and we have to kind of roll with the punches with what we're given. Um, I, I'd love to kind of discuss in gastroenterology how it's affected your patient discussion when you're actually gonna prescribe it for a patient. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's when you also think about it, is it, it you know, tofacitinib was studied in the in the oral surveillance, not every other jack, and you all have more access to to various jacks than we do, um, and so then every other jack, even more selective jacks that would be you know theoretically based on pharmacokinetics, you would think wouldn't maybe confer that same risk even in an at risk population. So when we look at the tofacitinib data in uh, patients with uh, ulcerative colitis, we don't see those same risks, and especially when you even uh, dive into those at-risk patients, right? Those patients that are over 65 with cardiovascular risk factors, we don't see that same risk. Even, and we use the higher dosing, which was the 10 milligrams twice mm -hmm. a day. Um, and then when we look at upadacitinib data across all indications, right? And um, we don't see that same conferred risk, both in low risk and at risk patients. So we haven't seen that same risk, um, but we're able to to have that discussion with the patient that, and, and I think you said it very eloquently, Dr. Wright, and how you kind of set it up. Um, and that similar discussions that we have is you don't fit this patient. You are not, you know, over 65. You are not a current smoker or former smoker. You don't have any cardiovascular risk factors. You you would not have had a positive outcome in that particular study, even if you had RA. So I think that um, that helps, to, you know, ha have the discussion. And then when we look at our specific disease state, we then speak to the data that we have and and really supporting that safety. I think we lost our moderator. Well, what, what, what we can also say is that in dermatology, that's the same issue that we're seeing, right? In terms of seeing the signal when you look at those post-marketing data, all of the post-marketing data in rheumatology did not show this. So we only saw this in the oral surveillance. So again, uh, we're gonna see the same kind of data sort of percolating through. Peter, we were just covering uh, dermatology for you. Thank and you. And, and, and don't you think a little bit of that? Those patients in the oral surveillance were also on concomitant methotrexate. Yeah. So, you know, when we look at all of our studies, methotrexate is the most commonly used background CSD marts. But if you look at the population, the oral surveillance population in general was a much higher risk group than all of our RCTs combined. Um, so it's not a usual grouping. It's really sort of cherry picking. Um, and so again, you know, we will never have a comparison, I think. Uh, we have oral surveillance cohorts that we're creating uh, through multiple data sets. And even there, we're seeing, yes, the higher the background cardiovascular risk, yes, that's where you're gonna see that. So that's what we need to take home, risk stratify patients. I love it. And the quality of life discussion about why we're doing it in the first place, putting it yes. into context is so important because a lot of patients are nervous about it. But I think when you say this is what it what it promises to give us and with these powerful medicines, there are some risks, but we're going to watch you carefully. We're going to be following along. And I also like what was brought up earlier too. It has a relatively short half-life. So if something goes wrong, you stop it and it's out of your system pretty quickly. If there's an infection or something like that, we'll deal with it. But it really would be a shame to not be able to utilize this powerful new, this new mechanism for patients who really could benefit from it. Absolutely. I agree.
Well, I want to thank you so much for, for doing this with me. This has been so much fun and so interesting. Uh, I think we're right at the, the time now. So I want to also thank all of our listeners and viewers for participating in this activity. Please look to the right-hand side of the page that has some different tools and resources for you. And then I want to put a teaser uh, that early next week, Medscape Education will be launching the Immunology Learning Nexus, a comprehensive web of 11 clinician ac educational activities and eight patient treatment guides with various touch points across, across three different curricula, rheumatology, gastroenterology, and dermatology. This dedicated learning center guided by immunology nexus chairs and educational collaborations will house all of the educational activities and accompanying resources. So please stay tuned and check it out. And thank you again so much for your attention. Thank you. Great being here. Yeah.